So what do you think of if I ask you to think about fungi? Do you maybe picture the mushrooms you bought from the supermarket this week? Or maybe you think of the mould that's grown on some of your old bread. Maybe you think of fungi attacking plants, causing disease, something to be controlled. Or maybe you think of the fungi that you see in the woods where you walk your dog. Certainly, I would have initially thought of a fungus attacking a plant and causing disease on plants, because as a plant pathologist, that's what I spend all my time looking at. But over the last few years, I've changed my perception of fungi being all about the death and destruction of our plants to being a whole lot more than that. From this small moment of thought, we can see that people can have very different reactions to fungi, but maybe that's not surprising. It's estimated that on Earth, the total number of fungal species is between 2.2 and 3.8 million. That's over six times the estimated number of plants. Over 93% of fungal species are currently unknown to science. There's 144,000 species that have been named and classi classified so far, and these species are incredibly diverse in their life cycles and habitats. It used to be thought that fungi were a type of plant, but actually now they're classified into their own kingdom, and they're more closely related to animals than plants. They can't make their own food in the same way that plants can, as they lack the chlorophyll that enables plants to photosynthesize. Instead, they have to use enzymes to break down their food, and then they digest it. Now, some fungi exist as microscopic single organisms, such as yeasts and others exist as interconnected networks of mycelium, thread-like structures that extend through their surroundings. Now, due to this, for the vast majority of their lives, we can't see fungi until they actually fruit to reproduce. And that's when we see the mushrooms or the brackets or other fruiting structures. Now, these fruiting bodies produce spores that are then carried by the wind or by animals to new locations. Now, fungi are mainly found living in soil, in or on plants. But they can also be found in fresh water, in seawater, on animals and on us. In the case of lichens, which is a fungus that lives with a photosynthetic partner of a cyanobacterium, an alga, or both, they can be found on pretty much any surface, man-made or natural. Now, fungi actually form a vital part of our ecosystem on Earth. They recycle nutrients. They're able to break down almost all types of organic material. They're the single most important organism that can break down the tough polymers in wood. Additionally, around 90% of our plants have a mutualistic relationship with fungi. Now, this interaction between fungi and a plant's roots is known as a mycorrhiza. The plant receives nutrients and water from the wide-spreading mycelium of the fungus, and the fungus receives carbon, or sugar, from the plant. Now, this incredible diversity of fungi, of this, this kingdom, has led to us not only collecting them and cultivating them for food, but also utilizing them in our food production and a wide range of industrial processes and medicines. You may all be familiar with one of the antibiotics we derive from fungi, penicillin. Now, this comes from fungus called Penicillium rubens. But aside from antibiotics, we derive a lot of other drugs from um, fungi, and I'm not talking the psychedelic kind. Um, examples include lovastatin, one of the cholesterol-lowering statin drugs. Additionally, we have immunosuppressant drugs, so drugs that are used to prevent organ rejection after donor transplants. Even a drug that we use to treat multiple sclerosis is derived from a fungus that attacks insects in its day job. 
Additionally, we now also use genetically engineered yeasts to produce many of our important protein-based based drugs, such as the hepatitis B vaccine and insulin. And since 2010, over a quarter of the Nobel Prizes awarded for medicine or physiology were awarded for work based on yeasts. In industry too, there's no shortage of examples of fungi being employed. 60% of the enzymes used to either commence or speed up um, industrial reactions come from fungi. They're used to break down the bleach and wastewater from cotton processing. They're used to break down agricultural wastes into sugars for bioethanol production. And they're used to speed up the pulping process in paper manufacture to reduce water use. Enzymes from the fungus Humicola insulins are added to detergents to break down fat stains and to remove the microfibers from the surface of cloths so the cloth feels and appears newer. Many of these processes would normally require high temperatures or harsh chemicals, but can be carried out in much milder conditions using these fungal enzymes. Maybe less surprisingly, we utilise fungi as biocontrol agents in crop production, so helping to prevent or control pests and diseases on our crop plants. Fungi that attack insects, such as the one we derive the multiple sclerosis drug from, we actually use to control insect pests on our crops. Some fungi are parasitic on other fungi, and if they're also necrotrophic, they will kill and eat the fungus they're parasitic on. Now, some of these we can use as biofungicides. One such example is a fungus called Coniotherium minitans, and that's parasitic on a pathogen called Sclerotinia sclerotiorum, which is a soil-borne fungal pathogen that attacks many important crops, including oilseed rape and a range of vegetables, including carrots and lettuce. Now, Sclerotinia is really difficult to control because it produces really long-lasting resting bodies called sclerotia. And these persist in the soil for a really long time and um, cause repeated infections of susceptible crops. Now, the Coniotherium minitans can be applied to the soil as a spore solution. And where the spores um, come into contact with the sclerotia and germinate, they will actually just destroy the sclerotia in the soil. Other biofungicides work by colonising the area they're applied to, be that the plant's leaves or the roots of a plant. And there they, um, and the soil, sorry, around the roots of a plant, and there they actually outcompete other pathogens. There's also amazing companies that are making fantastic product, products from fungal mycelium, from a type of leather. Um, which can be used exactly as you would use natural leather, to a range of materials suitable for use in packaging and for use in building. Now, some of these products could actually help us replace the use of plastics and other non-sustainable materials that we use day to day. Many species of fungi are actually now used for bioremediation, now, this is a process that uses living organisms to degrade and detoxify waste chemicals and pollutants. The pollutants that can be treated range from oil spills to pesticides. And one recent discovery of a highly radiation-resistant fungus called Rhodoterula taiwanensis means that that can potentially be used to help clear up ground that's contaminated with radioactive waste. Now, it's pretty amazing to think that some of these fungi can actually help us put right some of the damage we've caused to the planet. So, you might think that given their importance in our ecosystems and how many different ways we use fungi, that conserving them in the wider environment was considered a high priority. Yet today, only 56 species of fungi have been evaluated for their global conservation status. 
compared to over 25,000 plants and over 68,000 animals. Now, fungi obviously face the same threats as plants and animals do from climate change and habitat destruction, for example. So it's really important to raise awareness of this issue. But it's not easy because, as we know, fungi can be quite difficult to detect when they're not fruiting. But there are many organisations involved in trying to raise awareness, such as the Global Fungal Red List Initiative and the Lost and Found Fungi Project at Kew, who work with the 100 or so local volunteer groups up and down the UK who carry out regular fungal forays and record all their findings. So find out where your local group is and go along if you're interested in being involved. But also look out for the many events run on the UK Fungus Day in October each year. So as 93% of the estimated fungal species are currently unknown to science, their role in um, global ecosystems and the many ways we can and do use fungi, it's imperative that we don't forget fungi when it comes to conservation. We could be missing out on so much. It's a case of thinking back to the start when I asked you, what do you think about if you think about fungi? Well, hopefully now, you'll bring to mind the vast diversity of this kingdom. The many ways they underpin processes and products that we rely on. And that without them and their vital role in the ecosystems on Earth, life as we know it would not exist. Thank you. <laughs>